All right, guys, we started. I hope by the grace and mercy of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the internet connection stays strong. Uh, I've turned off the Wi-Fi. I'm connected directly to the modem. It's been wonderful. Due to the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved Son, His eternal Son, <clears throat> one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, in essence and glory and power and majesty and beauty and wisdom and knowledge and holiness. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. <clears throat> That's okay, Kareem. Make sure you go back and re-listen. Re-listen to these sessions or re-listen to this one and listen to the other sessions. Read the articles and ask God to guide you. Be open and honest and sincere because God knows your heart. You can deceive us, but you can't deceive God. So ask God, the true God, to reveal himself. And it's only a matter of time you'll start worshiping Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Father's beloved Son, in Jesus' name. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. <clears throat> you know what I like to do, folks? I'm just going to wait a few more minutes and then we'll begin. I like to take the theological vocabulary terms, even the prayers that Muslims offer to their false god, because Allah of the Quran is a false god. Muhammad is a false prophet. And I like to Christianize them. Christianize them. And we pray in Jesus' name, the internet connection stay strong. What do I mean by that? You'll often hear Muslims say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. <laughs> I like the Arabic language, man. In Jesus' name, the Arabic language was created by the triune God to be used to glorify the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yet Muhammad stole it. See, now here we go. We're going to get into a side discussion of whether Chuck Norris can beat Bruce Lee and, or Bruce Lee can beat Chuck Norris. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. And I'm not grinning. Anyway, let's focus. Yeah, hold the Father Spirit, all right? Yeah, let's focus here. They like to say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So what I do is, I say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa bil masih. La hawla wa la quwwata illa bil masih. La hawla wa la quwwata illa bilab wa libin. روح القدس إله الوحد صلى المسيح عليه وسلم صلى المسيح عليه وسلم تكبير المسيح أكبر يسوع أكبر Father Son and Spirit we love you in Jesus Almighty name Yeah Father Son and Spirit Okay good broken we just started Yeah لا حول ولا قوة no ability, no power, except by the Triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. I'm trying to figure out. I know quwata means ability. I think, uh, yes, yeah, quwata would mean ability, but la hawla. Hawla, would that be? You Arab speakers, help me out on la hawla. What's hawla? I know quwata means ability, right? al Masihu Akbar. Okay. Zo Kapel. We, we miss you. All right. I don't know what happened to first last products. And you guys here, you guys like took a break. First last was chiming in. All of a sudden he disappears. When we need some help with Arabic, he disappears. Okay. All right. Lord Jesus bless Luisa and her family. Lord Jesus bless your daughter. Lord Jesus bless everyone present. Lord Jesus, use me to be a blessing to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father and to the Son and Holy Spirit. Father, we love you, though we love you imperfectly upon us. Your grace. We love the Lord Jesus, the Father's heart that became flesh, the eternal Son, the beloved of the Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We are in love with you. Though we shame you, we disappoint you, we fail you, forgive us, Lord Jesus. Purify us, cleanse us, and wash us and our loved ones. My daughters, and the blood of the Lord Jesus, your blood, the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, cleanses, purifies, washes, and your holy blood, Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of the Father, the Father's heart that became flesh. Holy Spirit, we love you, <clears throat> and we're in love with you. Though we fail you, have mercy on us, and transform us, and guide us, and strengthen us, and teach us, and enlighten us, and empower us, and make us holy, and pure, and cleanse us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. And save us from our flesh, Holy Spirit. Crucify our flesh. Destroy the fruit of our flesh. Save us from Satan. Save us from his children and this fallen world, Holy Spirit. 
and empower us to be zealous for the glory of Jesus Christ, to be more holy, to be more righteous, to be more pure, to be more worshipful, to study the word that you produce, Holy Spirit, to understand the word and live it out by your power for the glory of Jesus and sanctify our hearts and our motives, purify us, Holy Spirit, purify and sanctify us, Holy Spirit. We trust in you because you are God Almighty, one with the Father and the Son and the perfect teacher. Guide this discussion, Holy Spirit, and please fill my lungs with, with life from your presence, with the breath of life, and my chest and my throat. Anoint, anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, O Holy Spirit, eternal Spirit, Spirit of the Father and of the Son, the Lord Jesus. And enable me to recall passages and interpret them correctly and perfectly, and save me from stammering and confusion. Enlighten us, Holy Spirit, with wisdom and knowledge from your glorious presence, and embolden us. And make us fall more passionately in love with the Lord Jesus and become more like Jesus. And our hearts become his thrones forever. Please, Holy Spirit, because that's your work in us and your work through me. We trust in you. Destroy distractions of the enemy. Destroy confusion and, <clears throat> and disunity from the enemy. Surround us with a wall of fire from your glorious holy presence and seal us for the glory of Jesus. Because we need you. We trust in you. We depend on you, Holy Spirit. We thank you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Protestant, if you ask again, I will seriously hurt you. I will come find where you live. I will lay hands on you. Bust your jaw and repent. Didn't I just say I turned off the Wi-Fi? Are you listening? Are you pretending to be listening? So you hear... You just post verses and go to sleep on me. Okay. Folks, as you can see, I got a Bruce Lee shirt. Let me briefly comment. Let me briefly comment on something real quickly. Because someone had sent me. Sure. Oh, so you mean I started the live stream without you being present? That's even worse. My goodness. There's something more important than you being here before I start the live stream? Man, you're really slipping, bro. All right. Let me just comment because this came up. Someone had sent me an email. A, a precious brother in Jesus Christ who loves me for the sake of Jesus Christ was wondering why I wore the friends t-shirt. Is it because of my wardrobe? And so he's willing to send me a gift card. I think he said to Walmart somewhere, you know, and he meant, well, I mean, he, he said it out of his love and he's probably listening right now. So the Lord Jesus bless him. He meant it out of love. He wasn't insulting me. Let me comment on why I wear that friends t-shirt for the record. I cannot stand that show. I think it is an evil, wicked, immoral show because it glorifies and promotes sexual immorality. I cannot stand that show. It is evil, and it shows like that that corrupts and pollutes, poisons the minds of men and women to glorify premarital sex and to have sex with anyone and everyone and their mother, and it's okay. An abomination to the true God and his word because the only sexual intimacy that God will honor is between males and females, those born males, born females, and holy matrimony sealed by the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay, now that's it. Why do I wear it? I don't wear it because I want to advertise it. I wear it because a little, little about myself again. And again, I don't want to make it about myself. I don't want to be dragging this. But I, I try to be as transparent as possible. Knowing that I can't be completely transparent because not everyone has my best interest. And there are people who want to shame me, humiliate me, and see me destroyed, even those who claim to be Christian. Right? Even those who claim to be Christian. Even the Apostle Paul. And I cannot hold a candlestick to the Apostle Paul. I'm nowhere near the Apostle So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying I'm like the Apostle Paul. Even he said he was on the peril, on the run from false brothers. Those who claim to be Christians, but they were agents of the devil. Claiming to be Christians, but wanted to destroy him. Right? Anyway, let me just explain to you why I wear certain shirts. This is a fact, and I'm not trying to in, engage in self-pity and, you know, pity me. and No, no. But I'm just telling you. Growing up, I did have severe self-esteem issues. Right? Severe self-esteem issues. I really suffered with self-worth growing up. And that comes from, you know, just broken home, but I'm not going to get into the details. So certain shirts, certain pants 
make me feel very uncomfortable because I feel very ugly, unattractive, and very fat. So when I find a shirt or let's say pants that I feel comfortable and in my mind doesn't make me look as obese or ugly, then I tend to like to wear those clothes. And that's just honest to God and being as honest as I can, you know, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, without trying to get into a pity party or get you guys to feel sorry for me. Right. So understand why you'll see me wear. And I don't I try not to wear the same shirts, obviously, on the live stream. But until God heals me, until the Lord Jesus heals me and the Holy Spirit heals me completely, which may not take place on this side of glory, because when we enter Jesus's presence, we'll be made completely whole, completely perfect, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually and physically. Until that happens, I struggle again. I struggle again. Uh, when I say again, again, I want to say, I'm choosing my words uh, correctly. I'm hopefully, the Holy Spirit will loosen my tongue and save me from stammering. Please, Holy Spirit, have your way to glorify Jesus Christ. Until that happens, until that happens, I struggle with self-worth. I struggle with self-esteem, right? And certain clothes just accentuate what I think of myself. Very unattractive, in fact. Even though people are surprised to hear me say this. People are surprised to hear me say because they see I'm very loud and seem to be confident and dominant, you know. And so just to share that with you. So for the record, there are certain shirts I like. Like this shirt, this Bruce Lee shirt actually makes me feel uncomfortable. You know why? Because it's a type of fabric that sticks to my, my body. So it accentuates my love handles that nobody loves to handle. <laughs> because I still haven't lost all that fat yet. But in Jesus' name, in time, I'll... Lose it and keep it off by his grace. Okay, is everyone with me there? Now you understand? Yeah, you understand now? For those of you wondering why I wear certain shirts or certain pants, because if I feel a shirt accentuates, accentuates my flaws, it messes me up and I'm embarrassed and I cannot, I cannot function around people. I'm rushing to go hide myself, like with this Bruce Lee shirt, okay? But if there's a shirt I feel comfortable in and I feel free where people won't be looking at me and saying, oh, look how fat that guy is or look how unattractive he is, then I wear that shirt. So I just wanted to be clear, right, because someone is wondering why. He goes, oh, because of your wardrobe, insinuating maybe I'm not financially well off, right, so that my wardrobe is limited, my wardrobe is limited, not so much because of finances. And I'm not rich, but glory to God, I'm not complaining. He provides for my daughters and I, praise his holy name. It's because I only choose select clothes. That's one reason why I hate suits, just to let you know. Because when I wear a suit, depending on the suit I wear, it, I feel like it accentuates my flaws. Right? So just again... Just to let you know that. So I hope that's clear. So we get into the meat of the matter for the glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, the Lord Jesus, and for the glory of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Again, I'm trusting him to guide me to speak clearly without error and to bless you and not bore you for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. To bless you for the glory of Jesus Christ and not bore you. Is that clear? Everyone ready? Because I want to finish the, our discussion on Melchizedek. Remember what I said yesterday, Pedro, believe it or not, when I watch those videos, I tend to feel uncomfortable again because I felt that those <clears throat> videos, because I was dressed up a little more formally, a little more professionally, I felt that accentuated my, my obesity and I wasn't comfortable. So, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. It's not about how I feel. May I decrease. May we decrease. May Jesus Christ in, increase. May the Lord Jesus increase in us, sit and throne upon us. And may the Holy Spirit make us more like Jesus Christ. And may we shine with the beauty of Jesus, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ shining through us. And by the way, I just want to encourage you guys to listen to Mike A.D.'s testimony. He sent it to me, a powerful testimony of how the Lord Jesus Christ delivered this man from his issues. And I pray also, Jesus Christ, my Lord, will deliver me in those areas where I still need deliverance. So powerful testimony. I posted it on my Facebook pages. But if you want to share the link, 
he's more <clears throat> than welcome to do so. Okay. So now that said, that said, let's begin. Now, remember what I said about yesterday. I said, you need to re-listen to yesterday's show, yesterday's session, because I'm not going to go over the things already discussed because I'm going to build on the foundation already laid last night by the grace of Jesus Christ so that we can now explain what does Hebrews 7 verse 3 mean. Are you in the saddle? And I need your undivided attention. Focus. Pray the Lord Jesus will bring more people in. We're up to 160. That blessed me. I want more people to learn this stuff and absorb it and use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. Right. And may the Lord purify us not to do it for fame or fortune, but do it for the glory of Jesus. I want to see more people fall in love with Jesus and see the depth and beauty of scriptures. OK, so let's begin. Are we ready now? Meaning ready. We're going to focus. We're not going to go into side issues, tangents, side debates. Right. We're going to focus on the material. I've noticed since the last the, the session that I had to delete two two sessions ago. That we don't see our sister Zena or her brother choose Jesus. I hope they come back in Jesus' name because it was Razzo, her brother, that got into this heated exchange about the flat earth due to Andrew Martin's comments. And he got a little condescending. I had to block him. But anyway, may God heal our hearts so that we forgive one another for the glory of Jesus. Anyway, let's start. Shall we? Are we ready? Are we ready? Just want to make sure because once we start, I don't want to be distracted. No side debates, no side issues, no tangents. Focus, ask me questions related to the topic. All right, let's go. Hebrews chapter 5. Now we're going to read Hebrews 5, verses 5 to 10. Hebrews 5, verses 5 to 10. Let us read what Hebrews, the inspired author of Hebrews, tradition says it was the Apostle Paul who may have used an amanuensis. Amanuensis is simply a fancy term for a secretary. Right. The Lord Jesus Christ, we know, is the author of all the scriptures. And he used various human beings to write down the words of God using their human personalities to do so. Fully incorporating their human personalities to communicate God's words through human language and preserve them as a faithful witness to our God. Hebrews 5, 5 to 10. Read with me, guys. Pay attention. Adam Eve. I'm going to try to focus on Melchizedek. Because in Hebrews 5, verse 5, he quotes Psalm 2, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7, which, yeah, I can't, I'm, man, Holy Spirit guide this conversation. Because I want to unpack Psalm 2, verse 7 and its significance, especially the way the author of Hebrews uses it in reference to Jesus. But I have to focus on Melchizedek. Holy Spirit, help me to bless your people and to fulfill your will in our lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. Because I get tempted to talk about issues. Anyway. So also Christ glorified not himself to be to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, God the Father, who said unto Jesus, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee, as he saith also another place. And by the way, that was a citation from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. <clears throat> as he saith also another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110, verse 4. <clears throat> when the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. He revered his father. He honored his father. He had reverence for his father and obeyed his father perfectly on earth and continues to obey him perfectly in heaven and obeyed him perfectly before he came to the earth. Right. But it's just talking about Jesus's earthly days, his earthly sojourn, his earthly ministry. Though he were a son, <clears throat> yet he learned, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now watch. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now verse 10. Verse 10. I don't know why would that be relevant, Michael Post. Because there are certain letters in which Paul did not put his name. So then that means we have to call into question those letters where he didn't put his name, right? So if you want to bring up this issue and distract us to go into a tangent, we can. Hebrews 5, verse 10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So notice it reiterates the point.
I don't know. Like I said, it tries, it, it, the buffering is less and less. So hopefully it won't get worse and worse because it was doing good. And I'm correct, connected directly to the modem. Anyway, notice Hebrews 5.10 reiterates the point. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Why in the order of Melchizedek? Because he's not qualified to be a Levitical priest, a priest in the line of Aaron, because he's not from the tribe of Levi. Let's go to Hebrews 7. Let's read Hebrews 7, 13 to 15. Key text is 14. Hebrews 7, 13 to 15, but key text is 14. What tribe did our Lord Jesus descend from? For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe. In other words, Psalm 110 is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ when it says he's a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And he belongs to a different tribe, a different tribe from the priestly line. All priests, as far as the Old Testament was concerned, had to be from the line of Aaron, from the tribe of Levi. If you are not from the tribe of Levi, you could not perform service in the tabernacle. And if you are not from the specific line of Aaron, you could not be a high priest officiating in the holy and the most holy places. So here's the question. Here's the question. How can Jesus be a high priest when Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi and he's not a descendant of Aaron? Because God already told us in advance, a thousand years before the birth of Jesus Christ, he is a high priest from a different order, an order that's superior and greater than the Aaronic priesthood, the priestly line from Aaron. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So this tribe that Jesus comes from never served at the altar meaning the temple in Jerusalem. Why? Because notice his priesthood. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Moses said nothing about priests coming from this tribe of Judah. The royal line, pay attention here, the royal line, the line of kings is from Judah, whereas the priestly line, the line of priests is from Levi, specifically from Aaron, and his descendants. Everyone getting it? You understand what you're being told in the book of Hebrews? Hopefully I don't bore you. I educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. But now Hebrews 7.15, which our brother did not quote. Hebrews 7.15. Because I have a challenge. Because we're going to try to go into the meat. I have a challenge. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. So you see what the author of Hebrews is telling us. God, a thousand years before the birth of Jesus Christ, already announced that a particular king would arise and he would be God's high priest. But to be a king, he has to be from the tribe of Judah, the line of David. And that's certainly what Jesus Christ was. Obed. Don't post verses for me, friend, or you're going to get blocked. Pay attention and follow along. Okay, you with me there? Listen to what's going on here. God already, a thousand years in advance, in Psalm 110, a psalm written by David, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, prepared the Israelites for a king who would be a high priest. But hold on, God. If he is a king, he's from the line of David, who's of the tribe of Judah. How can he be a high priest? Because he's a priest from a different order. He will be a priest in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron and not from the tribe of Levi. In other words, the Jews cannot object to Jesus being a high priest of God, even though he is the Davidic king, the Messiah, the royal king from the line of David, from the tribe of Judah, <clears throat> because he wasn't a Levite. In light of the fact that God already told the Israelites in Psalm 110, expect a king, a royal king from the tribe of Judah to be a high priest for me from a different line. You understand what God is doing? 
God already prepared the people a thousand years before the birth of Jesus because Psalm 110 is a Psalm of David. David wrote it a thousand years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And according to the New Testament, he wrote it by revelation of the Holy Spirit. And no Orthodox Jew, no believing Jew, because not all Jews believe. You have Jews who are liberal, like Protestants who are liberal, like Catholics who are liberal, who think the Bible is a book of fairy tales and myths and contains errors and contradictions and it's not necessarily inspired by God. You even have those Jews who believe that, right? But I'm talking about the religious Jews, those Jews who do believe the Hebrew scriptures are revelation from God. They would tell you that David wrote by revelation from God by Ruach HaKodesh, Ruach HaKodesh, the Hebrew words for the Holy Spirit. Now, let me qualify it a little further. Due to the use of Psalm 110 by Christians, and specifically the New Testament usage of Psalm 110, these religious Jews will deny that David wrote it. They will say it's revelation from the Holy Spirit, but David didn't write it. In fact, there's a rabbinic tradition. You guys want to be blown away with this? I hope I'm not putting you to sleep with this. I hope it's educating you. You know, there's a rabbinic tradition. That says that this is not about David, but it's actually about Abraham. Right? Hopefully, I'm going by memory and I'm recalling it correctly. But now, with that said, yeah. Anyway, that, that's neither here nor there. The Holy Spirit, I trust the Holy Spirit to save me from error. Again, I'm going by recollection. But with that said, let's put that aside. I want to focus because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, hold on. I do recall there's a tradition that says this is about Abraham. But then again, I do recall the rabbinic tradition where Abraham is shown the fulfillment of this psalm. He's given a vision because according to rabbinic tradition, Abraham was given a vision where he saw all redemptive history unfolding before his eyes, before it occurred. And then he says to God, you have my son. You have my son, right, seated at your right hand. How can my son be given greater glory than I? And God says, well, in a sense, I'm at your right hand because you are to my left. So the rabbinic tradition, as weird as it sounds, has Abraham at God's left hand, which places Jehovah Yahweh at Abraham's right hand. Right? Right? So again, I'm hoping I didn't get the tradition. Jump, beg you. Yeah, hold on. Hold on. I don't know why it's buffering, but okay, we're trusting by the grace of God. The buffering will be to a minimum in Jesus' name. All right. Yeah, like I said, I'm recalling that tradition. I may have jumbled it up. Lord, forgive me if I'm mistaken. Save you from error, and correct me not to repeat any mistakes. Because the rabbinic tradition is so vast and so diverse and even contradictory to try to even keep up with it, that would require a miracle. But now, focus with me. What's the point of Hebrews? Hebrews is saying Jesus is the son of David who inherits the throne of David and fulfills the promises of David. And therefore, he's the messianic king who rules on God's throne in heaven. And yet at the same time, he's a high priest, which according to the Old Testament cannot be. Because if you are the heir of David's throne, then you're from the tribe of Judah. And if you're from the tribe of Judah, you can't be a high priest officiating in the tabernacle. Because only the sons of Aaron, who are from the tribe of Levi, can officiate in the tabernacle. Particularly, only a son of Aaron can be the high priest. So how can Jesus be the king from David's line and high priest? Because Psalm 110 already prepared the people for that kind of king. Psalm 110 is not a Christian psalm. It wasn't written by Christians. It is a psalm that even Jews acknowledge was written before the birth of Jesus, whether they accept that David or wrote, it, wrote it or not. Still, this fact remains, whoever wrote the psalm according to their view, this psalm acknowledges a king who's a priest, but to be a king, you must be from the line of David and the tribe of Judah, then how can he be a priest? Because he's a priest from a different order. 
You give me, you with me there? So the Hebrew Bible has already prepared the Jews and all of us to expect a king from David's line who will be a priest serving God. Everyone with me there? Before I move on to the next point. And he already told them a thousand years before the birth of Christ because we take Jesus' words and Peter's words because he was filled with the Holy Spirit who agreed with the, his master, the Lord Jesus. David wrote Psalm 110 by the Holy Spirit. Mark 12, 36. I don't know. I think Obed is itching to get blocked. I don't know. I think he is. Mark 12, 36. Who wrote Psalm 110 according to Jesus and Peter, the slave of Christ, the apostle of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit of Christ to proclaim the gospel? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit down on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So Jesus says, David wrote Psalm 110, and he did so by revelation of the Holy Spirit. Case closed. If David wrote it, David lived about a thousand years before the birth of Christ. Does Peter agree? Well, he better agree, or he's a false apostle. Acts 2, Acts 2, 34 to 35. Okay, sorry, my neck is stiff. Acts 2, 34 to 35. We're going to get into meat. I'm just preparing you. This is the warm-up. We haven't even gotten into the meat yet. Okay? I don't get what you mean by double meaning, Guy Wilkerson. I hope you're not espousing liberalism here and saying double meaning. What do you mean double meaning? Acts 2, 34 to 35. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself... Jehovah the Lord said unto my Lord, so David wrote this, said this, and wrote this. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit down on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So Jesus and his inspired, spirit-filled emissary, Peter, confirmed David wrote Psalm 110. And he wrote it about Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ the Son of God. Right? Right? So the Jews can't say, how can your Jesus be Messiah and high priest? If he's Messiah, he's from the royal line, he's from the tribe of Judah, he can't be a priest. Wait, 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 wait. Have you read Psalm 110 late, lately? Your own Hebrew scriptures, Tanakh, your own Psalter stated that this ruler whose scepter extends from Zion, showing he must be a Davidite, a descendant of David, in order for him to rule from Zion, is a high priest after the Earl of Melchizedek. So what objection do you have for Jesus being both king and priest? The only objection is he can't be the Messiah, but you cannot object that the Messiah is also the high priest of God. You may object to Jesus being that Messiah, but you cannot object to the Messiah also being a priest performing priestly sub, uh, functions if you believe in your Hebrew scriptures. You see how God has silenced them? So this De Davidite, meaning descendant of David, who rules on the throne of David over David as his Lord and the Lord of all creation, is a priestly king. A priestly king, a king who is a high priest, a high priest who's a king. So God is already shocking them, blowing their minds away, turning their world upside down, down by inspiring a psalm that says there's a king will be a high priest, but not in the order of Aaron, in the order of Melchizedek. God, what are you doing to us? Why are you turning our world upside down and blowing our minds away? Because according to the Torah of Moses, Moshe, the Torah that you gave to Moses for us to follow, priests can only be from the tribe of Levi, and thy priest is from the line of Aaron. Why now are you turning our world upside down, speaking of a king whom we know has to be from the tribe of Judah, who's your high priest, and in the order of Melchizedek of all people? What's going on here, God? You get it now? You see what God is doing? Yeah, Hater Wood, he's got 800 people that he bores to death. With his long rants, but he doesn't send them here to learn and be educated because he wants mediocre apologists like him. You understand how deeply significant Psalm 110 is 
and affirming that the Davidic king is also a high priest who performs priestly functions. So the Jews cannot object to the Messiah being a priest who performs priestly functions. Though they reject Jesus as Messiah, they have no basis, no grounds to say Messiah cannot be a priest. Who said so? You understand my point? What I'm helping you see by the grace of God's spirit, and it's not me helping you see, the author of Hebrews is, is helping us see what the Old Testament already prepared the people of God to expect when the real Messiah comes. And the real Messiah came, and he is Jesus, the high priest of God. Clear? Now let me blow you away a little further. 2 Samuel 8, verse 18. 2 Samuel 8, verse 18. And Abdul Halaj, who reads Hebrew, writes Hebrew, reads Aramaic, writes Aramaic, will confirm what I'm about to say. And I'm going to give you the link. And Benaiah, the son of, and I have a hard time saying this name. This name, Yehoiada. Wow. Imagine naming your son that. He'll hate you for life. Was both the was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Now pay attention to verse 18. Guys, pay attention to verse 18. And David's sons were chief rulers. You know what the Hebrew says? Do you know what the Hebrew says in 2 Samuel 8, 18? You see, the King James translators rendered the Hebrew as chief rulers. Post the NIV for me, New International Version. Do you know what the Hebrew, Hebrew says about David's sons? His sons, which later on would include... Solomon, Solomon wasn't born at this time. Solomon is born in chapter 12, chronologically. His sons, David's sons, his male sons, which would include Solomon eventually. What are they called? Here in the King James, it says chief rulers. However, however, the Hebrew doesn't say chief rulers. I'll show you the Hebrew in a minute. Someone quote for me the NIV. Well, Protestant, obviously. Let me get the Hebrew. Am I putting you guys to sleep yet? Because I'm putting myself to sleep. Okay, hold on. Okay. Here you go. <sighs> Benaiah, son of Yehoiada, was over the Carathites and Pelathites, and David's sons were priests. Was that NIV? ESV. And Benaiah, son of Yehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Perethites, and David's sons were priests. So did you catch it? New International Version, English Standard Version, said that David's sons were priests. Wait, 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 wait. The King James says chief rulers. You know what the Hebrew says? There's your link, folks. David's sons were Kohanim. Kohen, Kohan is the Hebrew word for priest. Kohanim, im is plural. The Hebrew literally says they were priests. What? What are you doing, God? There's the link. Biblehub.com, the interlinear, interlinear, where you see the word is Kohanim. The word ruler in Hebrew would be Sar, because Sar can mean prince. Ruler, it can also mean chief, right? It's not sar or sarim, and there are various Hebrew words. The word in Hebrew, and Abdul Halaj is confirming. Abdul Halaj is confirming, and here I gave you the link, folks. Please, don't take my word for it. Click on the link. Thank the Lord Jesus for modern technology, free of charge, a fingertip away, where God has given us all these resources to go deeper into the word, <clears throat> And have greater understanding of the word, greater clarity of the word by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the resources that God and his grace has provided. All glory to the child God for his graces, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There you will see, there you will see, the Hebrew says, David's sons were Kohanim, plural of Kohen. And the word Kohen in Hebrew is priest. Folks, you see what God is doing to the Israelites? Do you see what God is doing to the Israelites? He's already preparing them 
for a son of David, from the line of David, from the tribe of Judah, who will be a priest, even though the Torah says priests are from the tribe of Levi, only they can perform priestly functions in the tabernacle, and only a son of Aaron can be the high priest officiating in the holy and most holy places. God, what are you doing? Why are you calling David's sons priests, Kohanim? And why is this royal figure, this kingly figure, whom David acknowledges as his Lord, whose, whose scepter extends from Zion, which is in Jerusalem, making him a royal king, which means he has to be from the tribe of Judah, line of David. Why are you saying he's your high priest forever? In the order of Melchizedek. God, what are you doing? Is it sinking in before I move on to the next point? The Hebrew Bible, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, has already prepared the Israelites for a royal figure, a king. And if he's a king, he has to be from Judah and has to be a son of David, who will be a high priest serving God. Shamir, for Allah, Rabbil Alameen. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. If David's sons are called priests, answer the question for yourself. Everyone got it or no? Is this sinking in or you guys are ready to, me, ready to go to sleep and you want me to just call it a night, a night? So a Jew has no basis to reject a, a priestly Messiah, the Messiah being a priest. Now they can reject Jesus saying he's not the Messiah, but they can't reject Jesus for being a priestly Messiah. If they say there's no way he can be a Messiah if he's high priest, show them the Hebrew Bible says you're absolutely wrong and you don't even know your own scriptures. So that's not a ground for objecting to Jesus's Messiahship. How can he be Messiah and the high priest? Well, take that up with your Hebrew Bible. Take that up with your Tanakh. Take that up with Psalm 110. Take that up with 2 Samuel 8.18. Your problem is not with us, not with the New Testament. Your problem is with your Hebrew Bible. You get it? Sinking in? Everyone with me? I don't know what Eric said. Dare say something because he said seriously, seriously though. And by the way, Abdul Hadij is a Jewish believer in Jesus. Am I correct? You are an Israeli who loves Jesus as Messiah, as your God and Savior, right? Amen. So you have an Israeli who worships Jesus as the Messiah, as his Lord, God and Savior, who's a Trinitarian, Abdul Hadij. Okay. So now you understand what Hebrews is trying to do. Hebrews, by the way, let me give you the context of Hebrews. I should have mentioned this in the beginning. Do you know why it's called Hebrews? I should have mentioned this before I began. Sorry about that. Because there's so much meat, so much foundation to lay for you to properly understand the context of Hebrews. Right? Yeah. You understand why it's called Hebrews? Does anyone have an idea why it's called Hebrews? Why is it called Hebrews? Anyone know? Exactly, Kareem Abdullah. He got it. It's written to Jews, but not just any Jew. It's written to Jews who are about to apostatize and abandon the Christian faith. Did you understand? That's the context of Hebrews. It's called Hebrews because this is an inspired letter exhorting and warning Jewish followers of Jesus not to abandon Jesus and return to Judaism. It's an apologetic and a polemic. Apologetic in that he's defending the truth of the claims of Jesus and also refuting Judaism, showing that Judaism is obsolete. It's now <clears throat> pretty much been fulfilled consummated, subsumed in Jesus. So now to return to it, you're returning to that which is inferior and obsolete and incomplete because Judaism finds its complete fulfillment in Jesus the Messiah. 
And without the Messiah, Judaism is absolutely nothing. It's incomplete. It's obsolete. It's of no value. Its value is found in Jesus who now completes it, perfects it, perfects it. And it's all subsumed. It's all fulfilled in him. That's the point of Hebrews. It's an apologetic, defending the Messiahship of Jesus, defending the new covenant of Jesus, showing that Jesus and his new covenant are vastly superior to the old covenant, to the Mosaic covenant, to the Mosaic priesthood, to the Mosaic temple, to the Mosaic sacrifices, because all of that is simply a shadow of the reality and the reality has come, and the reality is Jesus. He completes it. He fulfills it. He subsumes it. He perfects it. So now that he's come to go back to it, you're going to something inferior, something incomplete, something that has no saving value anymore. That's the point of Hebrews. So he's saying, as long as Jesus... Had it arrived, then the Mosaic covenant, covenant has value. The Mosaic <clears throat> sacrificial system has value. The Mosaic temple has value, right? The priesthood, they all had value as long as Jesus hadn't arrived. Now that he has arrived, he has now fulfilled it, perfected it, completed it, subsumed it in his person and his work, so that now that the reality has come, we have no need of the shadow because this was simply a shadow and the reality that the shadow is pointing to, he has arrived. You want me there? So to go back to the Old Testament is suicide. It's insanity. It's stupidity. Why are you going to go back to that which is infinitely inferior to the Lord Jesus to his priesthood, to his sacrifice, to his new covenant. Why would you do that? That's suicide. That's insanity. That's stupidity. And your judgment will be even worse now. Now that you have tasted Jesus, trusted in Jesus, believed in Jesus, followed Jesus, to now turn your back, your judgment is what much worse than it would have been before coming to believe in Jesus Christ. Making sense before I move on? Can I prove that to you? That's his argument. Let me prove to you that's his argument. Hebrews 8 verse 1. I'm sorry. Hebrews 8 verse 5. As the Holy Spirit enables me to recall the passages and the information correctly and perfectly without error and blesses me to bless you and excite you to fall passionately in love with his word and with the Lord Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. Hebrews 8 5. Watch here. Hebrews 8 5. Who serve, and he's talking about the priest on earth, the Levitical priest, the Aaronic priest, serving in the tabernacle on earth in Jerusalem. He says, they serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he's about to make the tabernacle. For, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern, show to thee in the mouth. Did you see what he just said? You know those priests? that are serving in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem temple, they're serving in something that's a shadow, an example of something greater. Side note, by the way. Notice the present tense. Let me read it again. Notice the present tense. Who served, not who used to serve in the past. Right now, at the time of my writing, they are serving in the temple in Jerusalem. Do you guys see the present tense? Who serve, who are serving right now. Do you guys see the present tense? I know I'm kind of loud because I get loud when I get a little passionate. Forgive me if I'm if I'm offending you by getting loud. Do you know why that's significant? Because the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed in 70 AD. 70 AD. But the author says. The priests are serving in the temple right now at the time of my writing. Here is internal proof, evidence from the book, that this was written and completed before 70 A.D.
You catch it? Here is internal proof, proof from the book itself that when the author wrote this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the temple was still standing and the priests of Aaron were still serving and the priests of Levi were still officiating in the temple in Jerusalem because you notice he says, who serve, are serving right now at the time of my writing. In fact, if Hebrews was written after the destruction of the, of the temple, then one of the most powerful arguments he could have used to show that the Old Testament is now obsolete is to point to the destruction of the temple. Guys, what's there to go back to? The temple's been destroyed. You have no sacrificial system anymore. You have no priesthood anymore because you have no temple. It's been destroyed. The fact that he doesn't mention destruction of the temple, which would have been a powerful argument, making his case even that much stronger, shows that when he wrote this, the temple was still standing. You get my point? What would have been more powerful than to show his audience there is no sacrificial system, folks. The priesthood is obsolete. You have no priest because there's no temple for them to officiate in. The temple's destroyed. What more evidence do you need from God? You made the right decision in following Jesus. But he doesn't use that as an argument, does he? Right? So what does that show you? Here you have internal evidence. This book could not have been written after 70 AD when the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed. This book had to have been written before 70 AD in the 60s. Now, folks, notice the dating. Written in the 60s. That's about 30 years after the physical bodily resurrection and ascension of Jesus into heaven. Within that 30 years, you still have thousands of eye and ear witnesses to Jesus who are alive. Do you see the solid historical, archaeological, textual evidences that the Holy Spirit has given you to have no doubt that this Bible is God's word? It's historically accurate. You can trust it especially when it narrates historical events. Right? Everyone with me so far? Seems like I have to do a part three, I guess. Okay. What was the point of Hebrews 8, verse 5? Hebrews 8, verse 5. Notice he says, The priests are serving at the time of my writing, in a temple that's simply an example and a shadow of something greater. Now let's go to Hebrews 10, verse 1. Hebrews 10, verse 1. Focus, guys. Help me to help you by focusing. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come. See what he's saying? The law of Moses. The priesthood instituted in the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant, the temple, the sacrifices. They are not the realities, folks. They are shadows pointing to a greater reality. Why do you want to go back to the shadows and the examples when the reality has come and the reality is Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God in the flesh? For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image or reality of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they are offered, year by year, continually make the comers there unto perfect. You understand what Hebrews is saying to these Jews who want to leave? He's writing to a group of Jews who've made a profession of faith in Jesus, who love Jesus, but now are having second thoughts. Is Jesus really the Messiah? Is he really the Son of God? Is this death really sacrificial and does it really atone? Did we make a mistake? We may have made a mistake. Was it worth it, this persecution from our family members and countrymen? Is Jesus really the Messiah so that it's, it's worth the sacrifice, even the sacrifice of our lives because some of us may be killed for following this Jesus? On second thought, 
we may have made a mistake. So Hebrews was written to say, you make no mistake. In fact, you know what the real mistake is? If you abandon Jesus, you go back to that which is infinitely inferior and now obsolete and incomplete now that the realities come. And your judgment will be much worse having known Jesus and turn your backs on him. Everyone got it? Hebrews 2 verses 1 to 4. Hebrews 2 verses 1 to 4. Get rid of Georgius the Greek, who's the Greek of Satan, who's here to distra distract because he's a Satan who doesn't want to learn the word of God. Okay. Hebrews 2 verses 1 to 4. Therefore, pay attention to now what the warning <clears throat> given here is notice the warning folks pay attention therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed be more zealous to hear this revelation of jesus christ pay heed to it and act upon it right to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let <clears throat> we should let them slip for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast he's talking about the Mosaic law. He's saying, if the law of Moses, which was instituted by God and his angelic host, right? And every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward. If that word given to Moses by God and his angels brought about punishment for those who disobeyed it, right? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us. We are eyewitnesses that this revelation of Jesus Christ, right, is from God because God gave his imprimatur, Neil Opstadt, his seal of approval by the miracles we saw. We saw the miracles testifying that this is of God, right? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and diverse various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we saw and witnessed and heard, right, according to his own will. You know what he's saying here, folks? If the law of Moses, which was given by God and his angelic host accompanying him, brought about punishment for disobeying it, how much more will you be punished? How much more? Will you be disciplined? How much more greater will your judgment be rejecting that which the Lord Jesus spoke while he was on earth and his eyewitnesses spoke that were backed up by signs and wonders from God saying Jesus is the Messiah. The reality has come. Now he's fulfilled it. Don't go back to it. You understand what he's saying? You understand what he's saying? Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. Who's RC? I don't know who RC is. I didn't know he's going to be on. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. If you guys want to learn about Islam, go, go to his channel. I don't mind. If you want to hear about the Bible, exegesis, stick around. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for our sins. That's it. Jesus is the final sacrifice. The once and for all perfect sacrifice. If you reject the sacrifice, you have no sacrifice. You have no hope. You're condemned in your sins. Now watch here. Watch here. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue. Grant me clarity of thought and speech for the glory of Jesus Christ. Which shall devour the adversaries. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable. See what he did, Matthew? Matthew McCarroll, you know I love you, right? See what happens when you post verses? I'm trying to read the flow. You're posting a verse from Matthew 10, 15, and you are distracting me and causing me to stumble. Brother, help me by not helping me, right? Let me read 27 again. But a certain fearful, but a certain fearful, looking for of judgment and fiery indign indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, Right? He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now notice 29, the warning. Okay, now Matthew, hold on, hold on. Are you being stupid, sarcastic? What are you doing here? I'm your judge, I am he. 
Are you trying to be a, necessarily offensive? Sorry, guys. People can't learn, you see. Let me read. Sorry about that, folks. Rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ and distract us. You see, at a perfect point, this agent of the devil is distracting us. And he doesn't learn. Of how much sore punishment if people were put to death at the testimony of two or three witnesses who violated specific commands of Moses. How much greater punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy? How much greater punishment will someone receive who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despised unto the Spirit of grace and has despised the Holy Spirit of grace, of favor? For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will repay, recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Now watch this. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you understand what you just read, folks? D despite the satanic distraction, may the Holy Spirit rebuke all distractions of the enemy so we can focus for the glory of Jesus Christ. You see what he just said? How much worse will your judgment be, you Jews? That made a profession of faith and said that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you believe that his blood sanctified you, purified you, separated you from your sins, and made you righteous before God. Now you turn your back? You understand what you mean when you turn your back? What you mean to say? You now are saying... You were wrong for thinking Jesus, son of God. He's no son of God. And now you're saying his blood is not holy. His blood doesn't purify you. His blood doesn't separate you. His blood doesn't make you righteous. His blood is common. It was the blood of a criminal who was condemned and killed justly because he's a false Messiah. That's what you're saying when you turn your back on Jesus. You understand the gravity of your sin? You see how severe your sin is in saying, I was wrong in believing Jesus Messiah. I was wrong in thinking the Son of God. I was wrong in thinking that when he died, he died for me, not because of his sins and his blood makes me pure. I was wrong. So you're basically saying he's a false Messiah. He's not the Son of God. His blood is not holy. It's simply the blood of a criminal that was shed justly, who's condemned by God justly, and he's in hell. That's what you're saying. And you think that your punishment won't be more severe and more heinous and, and even worse than had you broken the law of Moses? You understand the point now? So if someone tells you, what is the context of Hebrews? And why is it called Hebrews? See, again, it is not sufficient we read the Bible. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, to understand the depth of the Bible, the context of the Bible. It's called Hebrews because the author is writing to a group of Jews who want to turn their backs on Jesus and reject Jesus and go back to Judaism, which was a statement. We are wrong in believing in Jesus. You Jews who rejected him, you Jews who inst instigated his crucifixion and death by the Romans, you're right. He is a false Messiah. Clear? Everyone, uh, everyone following me. So far, are you with me? Is this educating you? Is this blessing you? Is this challenging you? Is it putting a hunger in your heart to go deeper into the word? Because really, I don't want to be here to bore you. I'm here to serve you for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to help you grow in your understanding and knowledge of scripture so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you grow in your love for Jesus because we cannot love him enough. Okay. So as all of that, in the background, as the foundation we've laid, the book of Hebrews is explaining to these Jews how could Jesus be 
the son of David, the Messiah, the royal king from the tribe of Judah and a high priest. You understand now why he mentions Melchizedek? Is it now making sense why he's quoting Psalm 110 verse 4? In order to refute any objection against Jesus being both the messianic ruler, the royal messiah, and a high priest. Because the Jew could say, well, how can he be the son of David and the messiah who rules on God's throne when he's from the tribe of Judah and a high priest at the same time? What are you talking about? The Torah says the priests are from the line of Aaron. And those who officiate in temple must be from the tribe of Levi. And the author of Hebrews is saying, wait, 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 wait. You must have forgotten Psalm 110 verse 4, folks. Hold on, hold on. You think you really know the Tanakh? That's a Hebrew word for the Old Testament. You, you think you really understand the Tanakh? Did you forget Psalm 110 verse 4? The royal priest, the priestly king, he is a priest who's a king. He's a king who's a priest. He is a priestly king and a royal priest. Psalm 110, right there, a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth. What are you talking about? And are you sure someone from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David, can't be a priest? When was the last time you read 2 Samuel 8, verse 18? Doesn't 2 Samuel 8, verse 18 say, the sons of David were priests, Kohanim? It's right there in your Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, in your Bible. You see how God has refuted all the objections of the Jews, leaving them with no ex excuse for rejecting their Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, God in the flesh? And that brings me to another point, Riaz. Thank you for bringing it up. Psalm 110.4 also prepared the Israelites for an eternal person who would never die, unlike Aaron and his sons, who had to be replaced constantly because of death. Because Psalm 110.4 speaks to a specific person. He says, you, that specific person, you are a priest forever. Uh, God, I'm confused here. Aaron was high priest, and he had to be replaced because he died. Death stopped him from continuing in his priestly role. And every other high priest after him died, so they needed someone to replace them. But you're saying this priest is a priest forever. What are you telling us about this priest, God? Are you saying that unlike Aaron and his sons, who were prevented from <clears throat> officiating as high priest in the earthly tabernacle by death because they all died, unlike them, this one will be eternal and will never die? That's exactly what I'm telling you. You see how God has already prepared the Jews in the Old Testament for a messianic figure, a royal king from the line of David, who's more than a son of David, who's more than a mere man. He's more than a man because he's also an eternal person whose kingdom is eternal, whose priesthood is eternal because unlike Aaron and unlike David and the sons of David who died, this one is indestructible, immortal, lives forever because he's more than a man. He's God in the flesh. You see how he's preparing them for that? Do you see how he's preparing them for that revelation? And lo and behold, let's read Hebrews 7. Let's read Hebrews 7, 14 and 16. Because now I'm going to get to, into Melchizedek. I got to do a part three, I think, if your guy is okay with it. Lord willing, tomorrow we'll do a part three. Hebrews 7, 14 and 16. Pay attention. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So then how can he be a high priest? Here's the answer. And, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. See, God already prepared us for a priest, not from Aaron, but from Melchizedek. And he already prepared us that this priest, unlike Aaron his sons who died, Will never die, he will live forever. There you go, right there, verse 16. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, 
but after the power of an endless life. Bam, did you catch it? Let me explain what he means. He wasn't a priest because of his lineage. He wasn't a priest because of his fleshly connection. When it says carnal commandment, carnal means because of his fleshly lineage. Because according to the law of Moses, only the sons of Aaron could be high priests. So notice, if you are not a son of Aaron, but you were from the tribe of Levi, you still couldn't be a high priest. You could perform priestly duties in the tabernacle, but you had to be a physical son of Aaron. So he's saying that Jesus isn't a high priest because of his carnal connection, his fleshly lineage. He's a high priest by the express command of God who ordained him to be a high priest, not from the line of Aaron, but in the order of Melchizedek. And ordained him to be a priest whose life never ends, unlike Aaron and his sons who all died. Let's read Hebrews 7, 16 one more time. Do you see the meat of your Bible? Do you see how much meat is in the book of Hebrews? Meat that the Holy Spirit says, eat and savor. Take it in and be blown away with the depth of Scripture. Hebrews 7, 16. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, not because of any fleshly connection to Aaron, but after the power of an endless life. God raised his son, immortal and destructible. My son, now I fulfill my promise to you. My promise to you is you are my king who rules on my throne forever. And you are my priest who will be my priest forever. Why? Because death has no power over you. You have destroyed death and you are immortal. Now reign and serve forever. Hebrews 7, 23 to 28. Hebrews 7, 23 to 28. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. See, it wasn't my logic. I was giving you the logic of the Holy Spirit and the scriptures. This logic that I employed, this logic is there in the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. I wasn't making it up, uh, making it up because I'm not that smart. This is the logic of the Holy Spirit who is perfect and all-knowing, almighty. Let's read. And they were, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. They died. They had to be replaced. That's why there are so many priests. But this man, glory be his name. He's the God man. He's more than a man. He's God in the flesh. Because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priest, priesthood. No one will replace him. No one will take his place. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth. He lives forever. He has an indestructible life. He cannot die. And because he cannot die, he'll never be replaced. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, blameless, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He's higher than all creation. Now notice 27 and 28. 27 to 28. Who needeth not daily as those priests to offer up sacrifice. See, those priests had to offer daily sacrifices, morning and evening sacrifices, yearly sacrifices, not just for the people but for themselves. This one doesn't have to do it. One sacrifice, forever, settled, finished, that's it. Right, First for his own sins, then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. And then 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. The law commanded sinners, frail human beings, and frail human bodies, prone to sin, prone to decay, who would die. That's who the law of Moses appointed. But the new covenant appointed an eternal son who became the immortal son by destroying death and rising in his flesh, making his humanity, his physical body, immortal, indestructible. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. 
Amen, Sahih Christian. You know this book is not from humans. It's from the living God, the triune God, the almighty God who lives, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You see the logic I employed wasn't my logic. It was the logic inspired by the Holy Spirit in the book of Hebrews. But folks, you don't, you still don't understand it, right? You still don't get it. You still don't get what the New Testament is telling you. Let me show you what the New Testament just told you. Psalm 110 verse 1 and Psalm 110 verse 4. You ready to get blown away? You know we got to do a part three, right? Lord Jesus, we only got to do a part three. There's just too much meat. Too much meat. See Psalm 110 verse 1 and Psalm 110 verse 4. Read it with me. Read it with me. A Psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Jehovah, Jehovah said unto my Lord, Adoni, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord Jehovah has sworn and will not repent. See, he will never change his mind. He's given his word to you. He has sworn and cannot lie. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. See, it didn't sink in, folks. You think you're blown away? It didn't sink in. According to the New Testament, and according to what you read, to, uh, read from even David, God is speaking to Jesus. Guys, I don't think you got it. A thousand years before the birth of Jesus, the Holy Spirit opened up the future and allowed David to hear the Father speaking to the Son. So David heard the Father say to the Son, my Son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. And then David heard the father swear to the son. I swear to you, my son, you are a priest forever. And I will not lie and I will not break my promise to you. Wow. Folks, Psalm 110 is an inspired revelation of a conversation that David heard between the father and the son. How many of you didn't see that prior to this session? How many of you didn't see the implication of that prior to the session? You understand what you just read? David, by the Holy Spirit, was allowed to look into heaven. The veil was removed, and he heard the Father say to the Son, you, my son, sit at my right hand, and I have sworn to you, my son, and I give you my word, my promise to you, my son. You will be a priest forever, and no one will replace you. That's what you just read. That's what you just read. I wanted to sink in for a moment. Guys, can you get rid of this demon? Even Karim Abdul sees that he's a son of Satan, his dog. You understand? David was given the honor from the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit says, David, look, look. And he saw the Father Almighty honoring his son, glorifying his son, swearing to his son, my, sw my son, I swear to you. Here's my promise to you. I will never lie to you because I cannot lie. You sit at my right hand. I will destroy your enemies who hate you because he who hates you hates me. And my beloved, you are a priest forever and no one will replace you. Now I understand why David knew that this one was so glorious that he's infinitely greater than David, worthy of David to worship him as his Lord. Is it sinking in? Is it sinking in? That's what the New Testament is telling you. If you believe the New Testament and inspiration uh, and its interpretation of Psalm 110, Psalm 110 is a conversation not between God and David. 
God and Solomon. It is an inspired conversation between the Father and the Son that David heard and wrote down by Revelation of the Holy Spirit. You want me there? Psalm 110. Let me repeat it again because we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it sinks and becomes second nature. Psalm 110 is an inspired record, inspired by the Holy Spirit through David. In other words, the Holy Spirit is saying, David, I'm going to let you in on a conversation. I'm going to let you hear a conversation between the Father and the Son. Listen. David, listen to what the Father is going to say to the Son. Wow. That's my Lord. And here Jehovah's honoring my Lord. And he's telling my Lord to sit at his right hand. And he's telling my Lord, you're a priest forever. Let me write this down. You understand? It's sinking in now? You now have an Old Testament record. Of a divine conversation between two divine persons. Showing the son is not the father. The father is not the son. And the, and the son is God who is also man. Who reigns with the father and is a priest. All in the Old Testament Psalm 110. This is why I say said to you. Why I get so angry and so livid and disgusted. When you have so called evangelical conservative scholars. Who would write a commentary in Psalm 110 saying, we don't know who wrote this. Thereby robbing us of this inspired Old Testament record of a conversation between the father and the son. You see why I get angry with them? And sometimes I question whether they're truly Christians or maybe wolves in sheep's clothing being used of the devil. With me there? So, with all this in the background, all this laid out for you. By the way, let me show you another passage or two passages where Jesus possesses an indestructible life, a life that cannot be destroyed because he is indestructible. Now, Jesus as God is indestructible. But what this means is Jesus also made his physical body indestructible. Jesus as God is indestructible. He can never be wiped out of existence. He can never cease to exist as God. But it's talking about his humanity, his physical body. Jesus has now made his physical body, his humanity, indestructible. As a guarantee that you who believe in him will be raised in physical bodies that will also become indestructible. You'll be glorified humans with glorified physical bodies that are indestructible and his resurrection is a guarantee that's what you have to look forward to if you believe in him and cleave to him and trust in him. Let's go to Romans 6. Let's read 7 to 9. Romans 6, 7 to 9, specifically verses 8 to 9. Romans 6, 7 to 9. Romans 6, 7 to 9. Romans 6, 7 to 9. For he that is dead is freed from sin. See, if you die now, that sinful nature that's part of your flesh, you're freed from it. You're no longer bound to it. You're no longer tempted by it. Right? You're freed from it. So now notice what he says. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Now, also, let's add verse 10 to see this beautiful, marvelous statement. Christ cannot die anymore. He's destroyed the power of death. He is deathless. He's immortal, indestructible. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. He died because of our sins. Jesus died because of our sins, because he took the punishment of our sins, which is death. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So Christ, in his human nature, in his humanity, that physical body that he took from his blessed virgin mother, by the power of the Spirit, he's now made his humanity, his physical body, deathless, indestructible, immortal. And that's what he's going to do for our bodies, our humanity. Sinking in? 
Sinking in? Beautiful, right? Okay, now, let's unpack Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3, God willing, and I will do a part 3. I will do a part 3, Lord willing, because I want to go into the shadows and types. Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now let's unpack it. Is he saying that Melchizedek literally is beginningless and deathless? Or is he saying God inspired the record of Melchizedek in Genesis in such a way to, to depict and portray Melchizedek as if he's eternal? Okay, let me repeat again. Is the author of Hebrews stating that Melchizedek is eternal by nature and therefore is still alive and is still a priest? Or is he saying that God in his wisdom inspired the account of Melchizedek in Genesis 14 in such a way to portray, to depict Melchizedek is, as if he was eternal? Which is it? Let me repeat it again. Is Genesis 14 verses 18, 20 an account of an actual eternal person whose priesthood never ends? Or did God inspire Moses to record the story of Melchizedek in Genesis 14 in such a way to give us the impression that Melchizedek is eternal, even though he's not, because Melchizedek was going to be a picture of someone who is eternal. Okay, because if you read Genesis 14, 18 and 20, there is no mention of Melchizedek's genealogy. We're not told who his parents happen to be. We're not told what his ethnicity is, his nationality. We're not told about his death. All we're told is he's a priest of God Most High, so he knows the true God, and he serves the true God, and he's blessed of the true God. And all we're told that he's the king of Salem, Shalem, and that even Abraham recognizes greatness to the point that Abraham gives him a tithe, a tenth of his possessions, and Melchizedek blesses Abraham instead of Abraham blessing him. The key in knowing that Melchizedek is not actually eternal, but he's depicted as if he is eternal because all these details were deliberately left out. Who inspired Moses to leave out all these de details? Who inspired Moses? Not to mention Melchizedek's birthplace, his ethnicity, nationality, his genealogy, his death. God did. Yes, the Holy Spirit was who, who's God. Why did God do it? Because God was planning Melchizedek to be a picture of a greater reality. Hebrews 7.3 tells you. Let's read Hebrews 7.3. Here it is. Let's look at it one more time. That last part, but made like unto the Son of God. That Greek word, aphomoio. Aphomoio, here, let me get you the link. Not to impress you with the Greek, so you can see, right? Let me give you the link. I may have to take a break. Hold on. Aphomoio means a shadow of something, right? Resembling something or someone. Something or someone that resembles another, right? Here, let me give it to you so you can look it up. God for modern technology. Here you go. Alpha Moyo. That's the root. Alpha Moyo Minas. Alpha Moyo Minas. Okay, here's the Greek. Let me give you the link. Thank God for modern technology. Thank you, King of Kings. Everything perfect and good comes from the triumph God. He gets the glory for anything good I do. Right? May he save me from my imperfection, my wretchedness, and sinfulness to be more holy and in love with Jesus. To be more like Jesus, more pure, more righteous, and to love Jesus more perfectly, and to serve his church and even unbelievers 
as an expression of my love for Jesus and be willing to die for him in Jesus' name. Now here, here's the link. Half a moyo. Click there. You're going to see the word. You're going to see the word. Okay. And then you click on the word alpha moyo manas. And then you go to the root. Okay. Here's the link for the root. Alpha moyo. You go there and you'll see that the way this word is used in Greek, it has the following meaning. I, uh, to make like. I assimilate. Make like to. Right. To make like to. And then you look at it, right? To cause a model to pass off into an image or shape like it, to express itself in it, to copy, to produce a facsimile, facsimile, to be made like, rendered similar to. Do you catch it? Right? Make like, to assimilate closely, make like, to resemble. You get it? So here it says, Melchizedek was made to look like Made to resemble, was made like the Son of God. So if he's made to look like the Son of God, he's made to resemble the Son of God. He's not the Son of God, and he's not really all those things. You got it now? You understand what it means? If the word used shows that Melchizedek was made to look like the Son of God, made to resemble the Son of, the Son of God, Made like the Son of God. Well, if he's made like him, made to resemble him, made to look like him, he's not him. He's not the Son of God. And he's not all of any of those things. He's not really those things. But he was made to resemble those qualities because he was made to resemble the one who is all those things. Folks, you understand what Hebrews 7.3 is trying to tell you? It is Jesus who's beginningless. It is Jesus who's deathless. It is Jesus who's the eternal priest because he is an eternal divine person who became human and who rules forever as a priest, not Melchizedek. It is Jesus who's all of that. It's the Son of God who is eternal, beginningless, deathless, not Melchizedek. That's what Hebrews 7.3 is telling you. Melchizedek is a shadow. Who's the reality? Jesus. So he's saying Jesus is beginningless as far as his deity is concerned. As far as his deity is divine nature, he has no parentage, meaning human parents. As God, he has no human parents. He has no beginning as God. And as God, he's deathless. And now as a man, he raises humanity, his physical body. So now even his physical body is indestructible. And as a man, he's deathless. And because he's raised and he's deathless, he's the priest forever, not Melchizedek. That's what Hebrews 7 is telling you. You understand now? So Melchizedek is not eternal by nature. He's not deathless by nature. He was made to resemble those qualities of the Son of God. The Son of God is eternal. So Melchizedek was made to resemble the eternality of the Son. God had Moses depict Melchizedek as if he is eternal because he's made to resemble those aspects of the Son of God. What aspects? The Son of God is eternal by nature. The Son of God is deathless by nature. And as a man, he raises humanity, his physical body. So as a man, he's also deathless. And he is the priest who rules forever and reigns forever and serves forever. Is it sinking in? I repeat myself more than once. Because I know we're creatures of repetition and I speak fast. So I want to repeat it more than once so it sinks in by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's further proof that Melchizedek is not eternal by nature. And that Melchizedek is not a priest even at the time of Hebrews. Hebrews is not saying that Melchizedek is a priest right now. You know what the proof is? Are you ready for more proof from Hebrews itself? Okay. Number one, when the author of Hebrews was writing, the temple stood in Jerusalem. Was Melchizedek a high priest in the temple in Jerusalem? Was Melchizedek a high priest in the temple of Jerusalem? Amen, Cindy. May he fill us stronger and stronger and with more passion love for, for our God. Okay. No, right? Okay. Then if he's not a priest on earth in Jerusalem... 
Because remember, he's king of Salem. Many Jews understood the reference to, uh, to Salem, Shalem, as Jerusalem. That means he was the king of the city that later on became known as Jerusalem. Well, at the time of Hebrews, he wasn't a king in Jerusalem and he wasn't a priest in Jerusalem. So then was he a priest in heaven? No. Let's go to Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. So I'm going to do a part three tomorrow. Or yeah, yeah, I'll do a part three tomorrow. And tie it in. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. Lots of meat today, folks. Read. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And because he's a high priest that's passed through the heavens, we have now boldness, confidence to approach what? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, let me explain what he's saying here. In heaven, you have the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly temple. And like the earthly one, in the heavenly temple, you have the most holy place. In that most holy place is the throne of God. Jesus, after dying and being raised immortal, ascended into the most holy place to sit with God on his throne in the heavenly temple. This is what you're being told. Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of God on God's throne in the most holy place in the heavenly temple. Okay? Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? So Jesus is the high priest serving where? Where is he serving as a high priest? Hebrews 8, verses 1 to 2. Hebrews 8, verses 1 to 2. Watch here. Now of the things which you have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Right there. He's the high priest. He's at God's right hand on the throne in the most holy place in the heavenly tabernacle. A minister of the sanctuary. You get it? And of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. So you have a heavenly temple in which you have Christ the high priest sitting on God's own throne in the most holy place and angels performing priestly functions. The true tabernacle. The earthly one was a shadow of the true one. Okay? Everyone with me so far, right? Hebrews 9, 11 to 12. Hebrews 9, 11 to 12. Watch here. Watch here. Focus, Raja. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. The heaven one, that's the perfect one. That's the complete one. The one in heaven, not the one on earth. Not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. Not made with human hands, the hands of creatures. Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The holy place. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Almost done, folks. Hebrews 6, verses 19 and 20. Now it's going to get really amazing. Lots of meat here. Watch here. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. I should have went with that one first, but I forgot. Sorry. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, because Jesus is now in the most holy place, our mediator, our intercessor, our high priest, and by his blood, he washes us and makes us worthy. Here we're told, don't be afraid to enter the most holy place. Enter it boldly because God will now allow you to enter because of the blood of Jesus. Now, I'm going to explain why that's significant in a moment. Which hope we have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. If you guys don't know what he's talking about, in the tabernacle on earth, you had the holy place and the most holy place. And there was a veil that separated the two. Guys, you got to pay attention here. 
you had a veil that separated the holy from the most holy place. Because of Jesus, it's saying, enter through the veil. Come into the most holy place. Don't be afraid. God won't strike you dead. Watch here now, verse 20. Whether the forerunner is for us entered. Jesus, our forerunner, who went before us, entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, let me blow your minds away with what is this saying. In Leviticus 16, we're not going to quote it all. We're not even going to quote it. You read it. The high priest was the only one allowed. Now imagine, here's the veil. Okay, here's the veil. This is the holy place of the temple. And this is the most holy place. Behind the veil, you had the Ark of the Covenant, which is the mercy seat with the cherubim. Aaron's rod that budded as a sign that he's God's priest. The golden jar of manna and the tablets in which God wrote with his finger the commandments of Moses. This most holy place, this veil separated it. The high priest could only enter here once a year with sacrifices to atone for his sins, his family's sins, and the sins of the nation. He was warned that if the sacrifices were defective, He'd be killed dead on the spot. As a sign, God rejected the sacrifices for Israel. That's why, that's why tradition says that there was a rope tied to his ankle so that if he died, no one could go take the body. They'd die too, so they'd have to drag out his dead body. Now, folks, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? If the earthly one, which is a shadow and not the reality was so sacred that if you entered the earthly most holy place with the earthly replica of God's throne, and if you entered there in an unworthy manner, you'd be killed dead, how much more dangerous would it be for someone to enter the most holy place in heaven? How much more dangerous and scarier would that be to enter the actual heavenly presence of God in the most holy place of the heavenly tabernacle where God's throne was and where God visibly appeared seated. How much more dangerous that was. Now notice the high priest on earth could only enter there once and had to leave, right? Had to leave, right? He couldn't remain. Guys, let this blow you away. Look how holy and amazing your Jesus, my Jesus is. Jesus not only entered the most holy place where the actual heavenly throne of God is and where God's visible presence is seen by the inhabitants of heaven seated on the throne. He not only entered there, but he's been sitting there on that throne for 2,000 years. He hasn't left. He remains there for 2,000 years. How much holy... Must Jesus be? How pure and righteous must Jesus be to be worthy of not just entering the most holy place, but taking his seat there with God in full, full view of all the inhabitants of heaven? You're getting it or you're not getting it? Is it sinking in? Marcy and Luisa. But now here's what makes Jesus amazing. Jesus says, because I'm here in the most holy place, and I sit here on your behalf representing you, you now can enter here with me, and you have nothing to fear because you will not be killed dead. My blood makes you worthy to enter. Come enter. That's what Jesus is saying. Because of my flesh crucified for you because of my blood, I now give you permission to enter here in the most holy place of heaven where my Father is, and my Father will accept you and delights to receive you because of me. Enter and don't be afraid. You understand now? What Hebrews 4.16 was saying? Hebrews 4.16 and Ephesians 3.12. Hebrews 4.16 and Ephesians 3.12.
Okay. Hebrews 4.16 and Ephesians 3.12. Read with me. Let us therefore come boldly. You guys remember? Thy priest would enter trembling and afraid that he wouldn't come out. Here Hebrews says, you have nothing to fear. Come boldly. Enter boldly with confidence. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help, to help in time of need. Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Jesus is saying, don't be like the high priest who entered the earthly shadow with fear and trembling. Be confident and be bold, knowing who I am and how much I'm loved by my father. Come boldly. My father delights in having you in his presence because of me. Enter and don't be afraid. You understand now? I don't know if I lost Louisa or Marcy. Revelation 7, 14 to 17. Revelation 7, 14 to 17. I guess I lost them. Here's, here it is. Louisa, all right, good. You're getting it. Revelation 7, 14 to 17. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These, and the context is a great multitude of human beings that could not be counted. There were so many from all nations and languages and tribes. And then notice what he says about them. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, guys, pay attention. The blood of Jesus, the Lamb, made their robes white, didn't stain them, made them white, pure, righteous, sinless, holy. And because his blood made, the, made their robes white, notice 15, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Did you catch it? It says, the blood of Jesus the Lamb made you white as snow, absolutely pure and sinless and good enough to now stand before the throne of God the Father. And God the Father delights in you and rejoices over you and floods you in his love. And it says, don't be afraid. You are covered by the blood of my heart, the blood of my son, the blood of my beloved. How can I ever reject you when my when his blood, my son's blood is covering you? How could I reject you? You catch it now? Is it sinking in or no? Okay, so Jesus is now on the throne in the most holy place as high priest, okay? We saw that, right? Everyone caught it, right? Hebrews 9, 24 to 28, final one, so I can wrap it up. Hebrews 9, 24 to 28. For Christ is not entered in the holy places made with human hands, hands of creatures, meaning the earthly one, which are the figures of the true. It's not even the reality. Pay attention, guys. This you got to really pay attention to. Okay. <clears throat> but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, the visible presence of his Father, our God, on the mercy seat in the most holy place. He's there sitting with God the Father. Okay, now watch. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. The high priest on, uh, on earth every year would enter the most holy place once. Once a year. Every year, once a year. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I'll explain what it means in a minute. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment... 
So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I'll explain what he said here. He, he said a mouthful. He's saying Jesus is not like the human high priests who entered once a year and had to do it every year. And every year, the high priest would have to continually present sacrifices acceptable to God. Otherwise, he'd be killed dead. Jesus is not like that high priest on earth. Because Jesus entered the most holy place in heaven, which is infinitely greater than the one on earth. Before God's actual visible presence, not a replica of God's throne on earth. And he did it one time by one sacrifice. So he doesn't have to do it every year where Jesus enters, presents himself, comes back down and dies. And then, no, he, Jesus doesn't need to do that. The high priest on earth had to do that because they were imperfect sinners <clears throat> providing sacrifices that could not get the job done. So it had to be repeated every year over and over again. Not Jesus. Jesus is the God man whose one sacrifice is so perfect and satisfying to God that all he had to do was present it to God once, and it is sufficient for the sins of every creature that turns to him. And by that one sacrifice, he makes every creature worthy enough to now enter the most holy place and dwell before God like Jesus is dwelling. You understand what it's saying here? And Jesus, the first time, came to die to atone for our sins. When he comes a second time, he's not going to die for our sins anymore. He did that once forever. When he comes the second time, he comes to save his people from this misery, from this destruction, from this hell, from Satan, from sin and death. Sinking in? Who didn't get it? Did it sink in? So I'm about to wrap it up. Did it sink in? Who's not getting it? Okay. If you got it, folks, here's the question. How many pre high priests, listen to what I'm saying. How many high priests were ordained by God through Moses for the earthly temple, earthly tabernacle? How many high priests? How many high priests? In other words, what I'm saying, if there was a high priest that was alive, could there be a second one? No, only one. No, no, Jojo, that's not what I'm asking. No, no, no. Pay attention. When the high priest is alive, could there be a second one? What do you mean, 12? What are you talking about? You're everywhere, Sharon. Only one at a time. Not how many high priests have been in Israel's history. How many high priests could you have serving in the temple at the same time? How many high priests could you have serving in the earthly temple at the same time? Only one. Only one. So how many high priests do you have serving in the heavenly tabernacle? Only one. And it's not Melchizedek. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. So Melchizedek wasn't a high priest officiating on earth in Jerusalem when Hebrews was written. So was he in heaven? No. Was he officiating in the most holy place in heaven? No. Only Jesus is there. And here's proof. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Read carefully and attentively. Read. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. This is the Jerusalem in heaven, not the one on earth. You've come to the true Jerusalem, the one in heaven. Now, who's in heaven? Who's in this heavenly Jerusalem? This heavenly Zion. Pay attention who's not there. Pay attention who's not there. And to innumerable company of angels. So angels are in heavenly Jerusalem, right? To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. People are having church in, in Jerusalem. So there's even church in Jerusalem that's above in heaven. Heavenly Jer Jerusalem has... Church meetings, but I'll continue, which are in heaven. And to God, the judge of all. So God the Father is there. He's in heavenly Jerusalem. And the spirits of just men made perfect. And the spirits of human believers that died. 
all human believers that physically died, their spirits left their bodies, and now their spirits are there alive in heavenly Jerusalem before God the Father in the presence of angels having church. Who else is there? Who else is there? Hebrews 12, 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of his sprinkling, the blood that he sprinkled, that he's presenting to God to make us worthy to enter his presence, that speaketh better things than that of evil. Where is Melchizedek? How come Melchizedek is not in heavenly Jerusalem? How come Melchizedek is not a high priest in heavenly Jerusalem? So if Melchizedek wasn't a priest on earth, and he wasn't the high priest in heaven, then that means Hebrews cannot be speaking literally about Melchizedek being an eternal priest who is beginningless. Do you see it now? All you need to do is read Hebrews carefully, prayerfully, slowly, and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate you. And there is no way you're going to come to the conclusion that Melchizedek is alive in heaven. And he is the other high priest with Jesus in heaven because there's only one high priest in heaven. It's Jesus. It's not Melchizedek. So then how can Melchizedek be an actual eternal uncreated person with an actual eternal priesthood? He can't. That's not the point of Hebrews. So Melchizedek is not Jesus appearing in the Old Testament. Melchizedek is not an actual eternal uncreated person, and he's not an actual priest who serves forever. That's not the point of Hebrews. Everyone got it now? So then what's the point? God deliberately described Melchizedek as if he's an eternal person, beginningless, whose priesthood is forever because he was meant to be a picture for the Jews of the one to come who would be a king from the line of David and a high priest who is more than a man, much more than human, but God Almighty in the flesh. Right? That's why you have even Melchizedek in Genesis 14, Let's look at Genesis 14, verse 19. 18 to 19. Genesis 14, 18 to 19. Genesis 14, 18 to 19. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed them and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Did you see what he brought out? Bread and wine. The, our Lord Jesus Christ, the true eternal high priest, the eternal God, the eternal son of the Father, one with the Father and the Spirit in essence, distinct from them in person, who became a flesh and blood human being from his blessed virgin mother that con conceived his physical body, his human nature, by the Spirit as a virgin, no man touching her. The God-man on the night of his betrayal, when he would offer himself on the cross as a sacrifice. On that night, he gave his followers bread and wine, just like Melchizedek did. <whistles> Melchizedek, you served Abraham and his 318 fighting men, bread and wine. Jesus, the true eternal high priest, you served your followers, bread and wine. A picture of was of what was to come. A picture of what was to come. Lord willing, part three tomorrow. Lord willing, part three tomorrow. More unpacking how Melchizedek and other persons in the Old Testament are shadows of Jesus, who is the reality that Jesus is the God man. Christ has died, Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ lives forever. He is the immortal one, the deathless one, the everlasting one, everlasting life. He is Jehovah in the flesh to the glory of the Father and the Holy Spirit, one with them, our God, our Savior, our Lord, our love, our life, our creator, our maker, our producer, our sustainer, our prov provider, our Savior, our all in all. Jesus, the Father's beloved. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. Bless us. 
bless our loved ones, bless my daughters and bring them, not this year, but within the upcoming months, bring them from that state to live with me here and convict their mother to repent. And that man in her life, Martin, he must go, Lord Jesus. Remove him from my children. And Lord, keep me holy for your glory. Bless us. Make us holy for your glory. Give us the help we need to serve you and the provision to do this. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So I ended with Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Revelation 1, 17, 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He placed his right hand upon me and he said, do not be afraid. Listen to what he says. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and became dead. And behold, I live forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the deathless one. And because you live, we live also. Lord willing, tomorrow I will be on between four, uh, four and five Central Standard Time, which is between five and six Eastern Standard Time. So look for me between five and six Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time, Canadian time. Christ is risen, risen indeed. I hope you're blessed. I hope you're blown away. I hope you see how amazing the Bible is, how deep the Bible is, and how real the God of the Bible is. And that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Marcy, I hope you're blessed. Because you didn't respond when I asked you questions. Christ is risen. And folks, remember... Jesus is alive. He's not a comic book character. He's not mythical. He's alive. He's real. He really walked this earth. He really is alive in heaven. He's really seated on the throne in his glorified physical body. He will really return physically bodily. And he really loves you. And he's in love with you. And his love is almighty to save you. And there is no power in creation that will ever sever you from his love. His love is almighty. And he loves you. And I pray in Jesus' name, we love him and we fall in love with him. You are our heart. And our hearts are your throne. Thank you, son of God. Come sooner than later. Take care.